In the last session, we talked about the physical architecture or implementation structure. We saw how we allocate the logical architecture or behaviors to the physical architecture or components. That step is where we assure that the physical instantiation will satisfy the requirements by performing the behaviors that are based on those requirements. With the completion of our allocation, we can do a final verification and validation and come away reasonably assured that we have satisfied the actual needs of the constituents with a system design that will work. In this session, we will talk about some particular concerns. First, we will look at how we represent the model to the design team and to other interested parties. We will close the session with a discussion of some particularly worrisome issues. So let's get started. One of the central benefits of the MBSE model is that it facilitates clear and accurate communication. Not only does it align everyone's thinking to the same conceptual framework, but it provides a way to communicate quickly and clearly the thinking behind the design process. All of the information in the model, which is contained in the database, is available for consideration by the stakeholders, customers, and design team. This is made possible through the use of views, which come in the form of diagrams, pictures, or even textual documents. The model itself is an abstraction of the solution and how we got to the solution. As systems engineers, we have developed this model for ourselves to capture our insights and creativity, but we also want to use it to communicate among ourselves and to others. For this, we will need to represent the model in ways that are understandable to a variety of audiences. Since we need to communicate with many people and with differing interests and stakes in the solution, we want all of that communication to be derived from a single source so that there is no conflict between the information presented to the different parties as they consider different aspects of the solution. One design is used to generate many views so that we achieve a common understanding of our design solution. What exactly is a view? A view represents an answer to a specific question. The question is posed to the database as a request for a particular subset of the information collected in the database about the model. Included in the request is a specification of the rules regarding the way the database is to return the information. For example, the request might ask the database to return a specific set of information formatted as an activity diagram. The database would assemble the requested information and display it according to the rules or conventions that define how an activity diagram is to be displayed. An audience familiar with the meaning of the activity diagram can then receive the information and understand it. Each view uses a formal notation so that the information contained there will always be understood in the same way. Because the information is being drawn directly from the database, every view is consistent, and therefore every communication is consistent. In addition, every view is a real-time look at the data as of the time of the request. So the views are not only consistent, but they're up to date. That provide, promotes communication and real-time collaboration. It's very important to recognize that the views are not the model because they're drawn from the database as opposed to being independently created. The views are not simply standalone drawings. The views are derived from the model. If an aspect of the model is changed in one view, that change must be reflected in all the views that display that aspect. By drawing the views from the model, this occurs automatically. If we adopt the mindset that a group of views are the model, we lose all of the connectedness of an actual model. 
Because no database stands behind the views, every change would need to be populated into all the views individually. The reality of that situation is that the real model resides in the head of the designer making the changes. This shifts the burden of tracking and maintaining the design to the conscious processes of the human designer. Where there is more than one designer, it also creates the potential for multiple models with subtle or not so subtle differences among them. Consistency in the design is put at great risk when the discrete views are treated as if they are the model. We have many different views available to us. Choosing the appropriate view rests primarily on the composition of the audience. Our purpose in using any view at all is communicating with them. Our message must register with them in order to fulfill its mission. As we choose a view, we want to ask and answer three questions about our audience. First, we need to understand who is in the audience. This means who in terms of role and experience. What is their background? What kinds of views are they accustomed to seeing? What will they understand? We need to choose views that will speak to them. That means views that are constructed in ways that they will understand. This is often accomplished by sending, showing them views that are familiar to them. For example, an audience of business and management professionals are more likely to identify with the functional flow diagrams than with the N-squared diagrams that speak so well to engineers. The choice turns on what will most efficiently convey the information. Next, we need to know who they are and what they want to know. An often forgotten principle of the psychology behind communication is that if the receiver has an agenda of information items they are seeking, their ability to receive other information will be impeded until their list is cleared. The strategy here is to know the audience well enough to anticipate such needs. That way their agendas can be satisfied and removed as impediments to the message that we're seeking to convey. Finally, we get to the point where many presenters begin choosing views that will most easily convey the information that they seek to offer to the audience. This is an important and entirely appropriate consideration. It just cannot be the sole criterion for selecting our views. With our selections made, we can see that in the final analysis, we do need to have them help us to arrive where we need to go with our message. They must be fit for our purpose, but in order to get there, we must consider all three aspects of view selection. The view must convey a relevant subset of the information contained in the model to the audience. It's worth noting again that the views are not the model, but are just an answer to a specific question or concern about the model. There are some pretty serious problems and issues that can hold us back as we try to design the best possible solution to the customer and stakeholder problems. These are by and large thinking problems that arise from our not understanding or failing to follow the process of MBSE. Unfortunately, this is one of the most common problems. It has its roots in a cultural educational issue in which we fail to give equal dignity to the parts of our problem-solving process. Our problem-solving thought processes can be divided into two parts. We alluded to these when we talked about innovation. We begin by generating candidate ideas. You will recall from session five that we create a large number of these, but we don't spend much time developing any one of them. In the study of creativity, this phase of thinking is called divergent thinking. The larger the pool of ideas created in this phase, the higher the quality of the ultimate solution because of the broadening of our choices. In the second part of the process, we call critical thinking. 
In this phase, we make judgments about the fate of one of the candidate solutions. We narrow the pool and zero in on a particular solution, which we then develop fully. The problem comes from our tendency to spot an attractive solution and jump to it. As soon as a likely candidate appears, we seize on it. In the most extreme form of this malady, we may even begin the process with a solution in mind and almost entirely skip the divergent thinking phase. By reducing our options too quickly, we cheat the divergent thinking phase and deprive ourselves of the richness it can provide. I call this a cultural educational problem because it's closely related to the reductionist analytic thinking that characterizes our Enlightenment heritage. We teach critical thinking in our educational system and downplay or even ignore divergent thinking. That makes it easy for us to cheat ourselves by jumping to solution without thinking twice. But it really is cheating ourselves, and we should be vigilant in avoiding it. The second issue has to do with understanding the problems we undertake to solve. We are all too often reluctant to invest the time and energy necessary to uncover the real difficulties creating our customers' needs. We tend to accept a surface assessment of the causes or even take an order for a particular solution. The problem is that such a solution may well not solve the problem. In that case, the customer is less likely to say, I asked for the wrong thing, than to observe that our solution failed. As we have already observed, Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. He was recognizing the complexity of the interesting problems that we face. Rather than deterministic linear chains of causation, our problems are intricate networks of feedback circles and adaptive mechanisms, living and interacting in even more complicated context systems. Exploring the intricacies of the problem and the context is critical to crafting a solution. We need to bring our knowledge of systems and systems thinking to bear in developing a real understanding of the problem space. Sometimes we become the victims of our own heritage. With its roots and origins firmly rooted in the military aerospace sector, systems engineering is, at its very base, a discipline dedicated to building things in the sense of bending metal. The development of the discipline has been influenced by the integration of hardware and software into single systems, and a significant portion of systems engineering now reflects a strong software influence as well. The UML to SysML conceptual heritage is a prominent example. But the extension of our discipline into other areas is almost always hampered by our focus on our heritage. Even overt efforts at expansion, like the NCOSI forays into transportation and healthcare, have centered largely on the same kinds of endeavors, just in another setting. Take healthcare, for example. In this area, systems engineers immediately identified the medical device industry as a target. This was a step outside the mill arrow arena, to be sure, but it wasn't a big step conceptually. In essence, it was a statement that instead of bending metal for the military, we would now go bend metal for doctors. There is a bigger step to be made, however. Healthcare is delivered with a system that organizes resources and applies them to the service delivery. There are some forward-thinking folks making this step. The movement into organizational architectures is another example of this kind of a step away from the equipment design. As a discipline, we need to make a greater effort at this expansion. The factor mitigating against it is that we tend to be tactically focused. It's easy to see how specific skills and processes can be applied to similar tasks. But true expansion requires us to think on a plane above the tactical. 
If we return to the foundational concepts like the nature of systems and the faces of complexity, we can begin to see that they reside everywhere in our world. Systems engineering can bring its principles to bear anywhere that systems intervention is needed. We needn't see ourselves as limited to bending metal and cranking out ones and zeros. For an adventure in expansive thinking about systems engineering, the book The End of Chaos by David G. Schrunk is an investigation into crafting public policy using engineering principles. Whatever the particular merits of its specific proposals, it is an exercise in true systems thinking coupled with an interventional purpose. We should seek that kind of freedom from our traditional boundaries. So how do we avoid these problems? First, we should follow a discipline process. That way we do not miss or overlook important steps and thereby sacrifice our solution quality. We should understand our, our processes in the light of our foundational principles. There's no way to write a universal rule book that covers every twist in every situation. It's by understanding and applying our principles that we can interpret and apply our processes. Above all, we must take the system's view of our problems, our solutions, our context, and our opportunities. The system view sets us apart and defines our responsibilities. We should always and everywhere see the world through its lens. Next time, we will review and summarize the ground we have covered. We'll put a bow on this series of tutorials. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and look forward to being with you again.